Hi everyone, this video is kind of going to be a long one, a little bit more on taxonomy and science within the context of Laura Carr Day. And it might not be the most popular or the most interesting for most people, but I kind of want to do it. So, yeah. Um, so firstly, taxonomy. Taxonomy is the study of classifying organisms, putting them into groups and understanding really that sort of aspect of them and it can be in species, genera, families which I have a video in the context of Laurel Carde, you can watch that which will explain the different like taxa levels. So phylogenetics is very important and this is the study of evolutionary relationships between genes, individuals, populations and at the sort of species level or even higher as going to genera and levels like that. This is because, especially with genes, it can be interesting because genes might have their own evolutionary path as might the mitochondrial, which I'll go into later. So how is phylogenetics organised? And I'll go over this before I go over taxonomy. So phylogenetic can be done really in two ways. So the first way is molecular. So this can be done firstly with the um, mitochondrial DNA and or the nuclear DNA. It can also be done sort of, you could say, with uh, karyotypes chromosomes, but this I've never really seen particularly done in fishes. Um, but, well, nor colored catfishes, but I would assume it would go ahead. So why are you doing molecular studies? So molecular is looking at the DNA. So the DNA is a unique sort of barcode and it will infer evolutionary relationships based on how close the DNA sequence is to another DNA sequence. And it does depend on different methods that are used. So there's a lot of models, mathematical models. Um, mitochondrial DNA is sort of separate to nuclear DNA. It is, mitochondrial DNA is found within the mitochondria, which is an organelle within the cell. It's known as powerhouse of the cell. And this um, respires for the cell, so producing energy for the cell from oxygen and other products. It does not have the same history as other, so, well, it is not originally, as we believe, from a eukaryotic origin. So this a eukaryote is, say, animals, plants, stuff like that. Um, and it is believed that it is a bacteria, I think, that did enter the cell as a parasite and then became amalgamated in it. And I believe the word is endocytosis. And then, so it's, it's why we look at evolution like a web, because species do join on to other species in some sort of formal way. So bacteria can be amalgamated. You could even say, looking at the gut and stuff like that, we are not alone, if you get what I mean. And the chloroplast is the same, and I don't know what other organelles are. But the mitochondrial DNA can infer different relationships to the nuclear DNA. I believe the nuclear DNA is a lot more rapidly changing, more, a lot more evolving quicker, so it can be a lot more difficult to use for molecular assessments. Whereas the mitochondrial DNA does not, it is also shorter, it's not coding for that many things. And that's what DNA really does. It codes for the different proteins that produce organisms. And you can use individual genes for molecular phylogeny. And this depends, you can use either individual genes within mitochondrial DNA sequences or the nuclear. The thing is with genes is they can infer another relationship. So if you're using one or two or a few genes, they can infer a different relationship to what the actual whole DNA or the true story is. So it's better to use a whole range and as many as possible. So the next method is your traditional taxonomy and phylogenetics, which is what I prefer to use. And this is more phylogical phylogeny. And this is seen often as really outdated and it shouldn't be. Uh, it has been shown that molecular assessments, molecular phylogeny has not given all the answers. It has kind of made it more complicated and has not given really what we wanted. And morphological really does have its place. Morphological assessments infer a relationship because your morphology is built in your DNA largely. 
And although we do know stuff about epigenetics and stuff like that, it does infer different relationships. Of course, you have the issues of um, um, convergent evolution. So one species might have a gene that makes it look similar to another one. So dolphins, ichthyosaurs, fish all look pretty similar, but they're not more close evolved than ichthyosaurs and reptilians, or reptiles, ichthyosaurs, ichthyosaurs, yes, and then dolphins. They are mam mammals, and there's plenty of different tacks in between that show that these events evolved individually. And I cannot remember the name. Um, but you also get what we call homolog homologous features, and these are features that look similar and evolved from an individual, um, from a common ancestor. So um, you could say homologous uh, features are s stuff like the famine fangal, um, arches, the gill plates, and then sort of the ear bones. But I'm not that sort of evolutionary biologist. <laughs> Me and sort of paleontology, I, I'm not great on it. So morphology is based on features. So you're looking at individual features. Say, um, does it have the um, odontos? Maybe the, every fish with odontos is the same. Does it not have scales? So this does mean you're building up assumptions and the whole thing with um, sort of phylogeny is you want to try and avoid assumption so Occam's razor but you're kind of seeing features and what matches together so there's quite a few computer programs that do this but in the past you'd have to do it by hand and a lot of sort of doing um, mathematical like equations and it does get difficult the more taxa the more difficult it is so you are creating a tree an evolution tree by morphological features and I can't I'm not describing it well at all so Yes, this does have its issues. Generally, the most common method is using parsimony, which is the least assumptions is true to produce the phylogeny tree. So not assuming that events, um, multiple evolutionary events to produce one gene, um, to produce one phenotype. A phenotype is a sort of like how the species looks. A genotype is how the species um or what's in your genetic coding. So phenotype is more, not just at the species level, at the individual level. So the next thing is taxo with taxonomy is scientific names. So scientific names have been around a long time, but the main system is that we have used for a few hundred years is the binomial system. And this was sort of made by Linnaeus. And this was to classify species under two names. Because originally, before that, you had scientific names that were really long. And they're difficult sometimes to pronounce as they are. But now, but then there was created a binomial system. So you have the genus, then you have the species. And generally, this is... Um, yeah, so the binomial system is the only one you'll really see around. But why do we use scientific names? They are universal, they're regulated under nomenclature sort of organisation, so there are rules, and one species, one name. But I have done other videos of arguments for, um, for scientific names, as opposed to common names or other systems that people have used, which are really just common names. So the nomenclature is kind of important. You've got a lot of shorthand and it kind of infers different things about what you believe the species is. CF meaning confer to, meaning we think it's this. Um, AF meaning affinity with, which means it's like this, but we don't think it is this. SP meaning species. SPP is um, species in plural. And there's quite a lot and you kind of find new ones all the time, like N means new species. Um, and then I think NOV means novel, um, but there's so many. And it's extremely useful because not all species have a common name. Some species are very similar. Common names can be deceptive. So, yeah, and I'll probably do a better video probably on the scientific names themselves because they are quite complex in a way, but they are useful to know, especially if you're going into fish because there's so many species and... If you want to go beyond your sort of common species, then scientific names are really the way to go. 
So I, my previous video was on what is a species, but I'll kind of summarise that. And a species depends on the taxa, um, really. I because everyone has their own definition, but really it does depend on the taxa. Different taxa go through different evolutionary paths. Some are more prone to polyploidy. Polyploidy is where um, you have different numbers of chromosomes um, compared to within one species, which is more of a big thing within plants. And then um, sort of a v vague, some of them are quite vague in some ways. So I have been asked how a species describe. So firstly, why are species described? Species are described so we can have like a definition, say this is one species and these aren't the same species. And it's kind of like how we like to organise things, how people like to put things in categories and groups. And it makes seeing the sort of life forms, organisms, tree of life, it makes it so much easier to see if you have species, and especially if you put them into units, because otherwise you've got this spectrum and no one quite knows where to place things or what things are. Everyone has their own definition. So a scientific paper will first so a species description will be a scientific paper. It will be peer-reviewed, most ideally. So peer-review means that it's uh, reviewed by other scientists also in that field or in other fields. And they will be able to say, this is likely true, this is not. Find the flaws in it. Because some papers are really flawed, especially when you look at their results, their methods. And some people do like to get away with things because naming new species is quite like... A lot of people will want to do that because you get your name on saying if you get what I mean. So they will be published in a journal, as I said. An example would be the Journal of Fish Biology. Um, there's, um, I think it's Neotropical Exploration of Fresh Waters. That's one. There's quite a few, and generally certain ones will be aimed at different fields of science so you get physics ones i believe you you i've seen ones for classics so humanities but the ones for taxonomy tend to be mixed between different journals depends what they allow to be published so it's kind of like a magazine but for scientists and quite a lot of rules and a lot of like editing to go into them so a species description will contain a diagnosis. So this will say, this is one species and it has these features that define it from X group and then it will define it from S group and that. So it's working on which are most similar morphologically. And this can be a little bit difficult if you're reading it and it's look at skeletal features because when you work with living specimens, you don't really want to go, oh, I look at its skull because half the time you can't even see it so yeah but so it'll give reasons why mo in morphometrics and meristatics so morphometrics is kind of like your measurements your standard length which i've got a video about anatomy and that will talk about standard length total length it will give sort of your length between the eyes the nares and stuff like that um and then meristatics is your number of soft dorsal rays, number of soft pectoral rays, length of spine, number of spines I've seen a few times. And it really does, these are, are your important measurements and it kind of gives backing to say, I don't think this is the same species as another fish. And that's why it's really important because they are saying like giving your reasons why so in a if you're doing humanities you might want to like say reference but when you're doing primary studies you can't really reference and you can't so it's like it's so hard to explain but yeah and it does compare to other species described and that is the bit of a painful bit because it doesn't because likely these undescribed species might not have been found yet and don't have a name you can't really say I compare to this one, which is why looking at more modern studies can be really helpful. The thing is, is that older studies might not be so um, detailed. So you might be looking at a study that um, is like from the 1920s and it will just say literally like fish of tentacles for an ancestress. And you're like, well, that's no help at all because 
what am I going to do with that? Uh, and so using more modern studies, there might be reviews of taxonomy that are really useful and reviewing might is generally meaning a change of the known taxonomy and uh, almost phylogenetics of the species, what we know to be true. So it might change the genus, it might change the family, it might change other things um, or even add to the description so where there might not be a type specimen. So a type specimen is like a specimen, an individual of that species that is used to describe the species and is like a representative. You also get syntypes which is similar but for a species that was synonymized into that type species is species and you get other ones. So the holotype is the main one, that is the main type and it does get a bit confusing to be honest. Um, but yes you will get loads of different sort of types of papers depending on what they're trying to say and it's really useful because as we know more, as we study more with science, it does change what we thought was true and you have to update the times. It doesn't matter if you like one scientific name more than another, that scientific name is probably not, might not be true and it might be true. We always have to take the older name over the newer name which does cause issues but so uh, Tyrioplichthys and Anacity was synonymized with Tyrioplichthys and Bersetti and it depends who you're talking to so they um, so that means that Ambersetti which is the older one is the formal accepted name there's other things like uh, you got um, tax have been split up so genera so a stereosoma, I believe someone put in stereosoma ichthys, um, but I never actually read the literature into that. So with Corydoras, you have Corydoras as a whole, and then you have um, Brochus nested within, depending on which papers you're reading. And that's why you'll see that Brochus has been synonymized currently, according to a paper by Brito in 2003 with um, Corydoras, and there was not enough like evidence to provide that they're not a different like genera but other than that and if Brochus stands that makes Brochus uh, that makes Corydorus what's known as paraphyletic it contains the ancestor but not all of the descendants of the ancestor and this is the same with dinosaurs and birds if di birds aren't dinosaurs they are paraphyletic and this is not ideal so fish, sarcopterygii, um, you have mammals and all of that, reptiles, amphibians nested within. So this makes these taxa somewhat, depending on who you're talking to, paraphyletic. What you kind of generally aim for is monophyletic. So all the, ans the ancestor and all of the descendants are in that clade. So that is what you kind of aim for in science. Um, well, to a degree, anyway. So this is kind of why taxa do change depending on things and people do get attached to certain tax and then they get revised. It's like... <laughs> so you will see change and it's always good. I like Facebook groups because people will post the latest scientific journals if you go on some Facebook groups. And I'll link ones below that are really good for keeping up to date with the science. So taxonomy, sort of last thing is why taxonomy is important. It gives a description and a diagnosis is the main thing. It is a study that without describing species, you've got no way of knowing what they look like because everyone's going to talk about a species that, and you don't know you're talking about the same thing. And so it makes it important for conservation. How do you know what you found is what you thought it was? That's where taxonomists are useful, especially if you're getting invasive species. So invasive species might appear and most of the people that study within that country will be used to what they're used to, rather than what is coming in from other different countries that a taxonomist might know. Taxonomy is useful because you can describe species that might be useful for medicine, health, anything like that, or even just species to utilise in different ways, so ornamentally. 
and without a name there's nothing to conserve them on you can't really do as much with them it's just like an undescribed species um and it's always useful to know evolution and the evolution hi evolutionary history because we can apply it elsewhere so anyway thank you for watching um i'm gonna make another video uh, on thursday or friday not quite planned what on yet um but yeah anyway thank you for watching